thank you everyone for um, joining us today. We're thrilled to be able to do this. Um, I want to just give you a couple of little administrative notes. One is that your videos are off. Um, there's a couple hundred people joining us today, so it'd be hard to see everybody on video. So video is off and microphones are muted. Um, you'll have an opportunity to send us questions via the Q&A feature, which you should see in the Zoom toolbar. Um, and in case we can't get to your question, don't worry, we will, um, we will um, give our emails out and you can always reach us um, through our emails if we can't answer your question. Um, I, I just want to start before I do introductions by just kind of acknowledging the challenging, um, difficult time we're all in. And actually, before we start, I should tell you that who's sitting here next to me is my daughter, Chelsea, um, who has Rett syndrome. She's 23 years old and she's been my coworker the last five or six weeks. And, um, and, I, and I know that most many of you are probably there with your kids as well. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the, the difficult time that we're all facing. I, I think for families that have special needs kids, it's even more challenging. We're out of our routines. We don't have caregivers, therapists. Um, we're stuck at home. And um, I just, you know, I just want you to know that that I'm cognizant of that, and I and and I'm in the same situation that many of you are. And I'm thinking about all of you, even though I don't know you personally. Um, just, you know, I, I I think we as parents of children with Rett syndrome, we have this special bond anyway. Um, even if we've never met, but I think it's even stronger um, during situations like this. Um, okay, so I would like to introduce um, my panelists today. Um, first, my colleague, Dr. Jana Von Heen. Um, she is our Senior Director of Research and Clinical Strategy. Um, she has a PhD in genetics and molecular biology. Um, she's worked in industry for over a decade um, working in neurodevelopmental and central nervous system disorders. At RSRT, she is responsible for our clinical research projects. Um, so that includes, for example, our outcome measure uh, initiative, our biomarker initiative, the clinical trial consortium, um, the ketamine project, um, and more. Um, and then our other panelist is Dr. Matt List. Um, Dr. List received his undergraduate degree from the University of Cambridge um, and his PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Um, for the last 10 years, he's been a postdoc in the lab um, of Adrian Bird, a name that many of you are familiar with. Um, and he's also a member of the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain. So I wanna thank both Dr. List and Dr. Van Heen for joining us today. All right, so let me just tell you briefly the agenda. Um, Dr. Van Heen is going to talk to us um, about kind of molecular biology, some of the central dogma that will set the stage for Dr. List to then talk to us a little bit about um, the basics of MECP2 function and then discussion of MECP2 mutations. And then it'll come back to me with a few concepts um, that I want to share and then we'll do a, a Q&A. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll mention that we'll leave our email addresses with you in case we don't address your, your questions. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing and Jana's gonna pick it up from here. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, Monica, can you confirm you can see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm going to introduce everyone today to the central dogma of molecular biology. And the central dogma of molecular biology is the process by which genetic information contained in the DNA is copied or transcribed into an RNA molecule through transcription, and then um, how that RNA molecule is decoded or translated in order to build a protein. And that occurs through a process called translation. And I'm going to refer to um, each of these. Uh, I'll go into some details about each of these next. So to understand transcription, we first need to talk about nucleotide bases. And nucleotide bases are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And there are two classes of nucleotide bases. There are purines, 
which are shown here, guanine and adenine. And you can see these structures are similar and they have two carbon rings. And there's also pyrimidines. And this is our second class of nucleotide bases. And these are um, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And what's great about purines and pyrimidines is they prefer to pair in very specific ways when they're in a double strand molecule. And so for example, guanine prefers to pair with cytosine and adenine will prefer to pair with thymine in double-stranded DNA molecules. And this gives us our four DNA bases, G, C, A, and T. Now thymine is a DNA-specific base, and so in RNA molecules, adenine will instead pair with uracil. And that gives us our four RNA bases, which are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil. So let's go back to our double-stranded DNA molecule. And so what's great about the way that these purines pair with pyrimidines is it's very easy to tell which nucleotide is going to be in the opposite strand. So if you look at our example molecule at the top here, you can see where everywhere that there's an A in one strand, there's a T on the opposite strand. And everywhere where there's a G on one strand, there's a C on the opposite strand. And so this sets up a really great way for DNA to be copied because as soon as you know the DNA sequence on one strand, you automatically know the sequence on the opposite strand because of the way that these nucleotides like to pair. So if uh, we want, when we wanna build an RNA molecule, the double-stranded DNA will separate into its single strands, um, and it will separate into the coding strand and the template strand. Now the coding strand of DNA contains the exact genetic sequence of the gene. And the RNA molecule will then be built from uh, the template strand. And so everywhere where there's a T in the DNA, the RNA molecule will incorporate an A. If there's an A in the DNA, the molecule, RNA molecule will incorporate a U. If there's a C in the DNA, a G will be incorporated into the RNA molecule, and so on and so forth until um, the RNA molecule has been fully built. And what you get at the end of transcription is an exact copy of the genetic sequence of the coding strand. Okay, and, and that's transcription. So what happens then once we have our primary RNA transcript, how does that get decoded or translated into a protein? And so to talk about translation, we first need to understand codons. Now, um, the ribosome is the cellular machine that will build a protein, and it will read this RNA molecule in sets of three nucleotides at a time. And a set of three nucleotides is referred to as a codon and each codon will correspond to an amino acid or a stop. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, just like nucleotide bases are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. So if you look at our example molecule up here on the screen, you can see uh, if you start the first codon here at CAU, this is gonna correspond to a specific amino acid called histidine. And the RNA molecule will be read with each subsequent codon corresponding to a subsequent amino acid. And by reading these codons, these amino acids get linked together in an amino acid chain, and this is protein. So if you um, now look at the table on the right-hand side of the screen, this is called a codon table. And you'll see here um, each of the four RNA bases that can be incorporated into each position of the codon. So we have our U, C, A, or G that can be in the first, second, or third nucleotide position of the codon. And the, what you can tell from this table is there are 64 potential combinations of nucleotides to make up codons. There are 64 codons, but there are only 20 amino acids that are used to build um, a protein. And so what's immediately obvious is that there's redundancy in this table where multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. So if we take serine as an example, which is shown in, in this box that I'm circling here, the codons UCU, UCC, UCA, and UCG will all code for the amino acid serine. And you can see over here, there's another section um, that I can't see right now, but there are two additional codons that will also code for serine in this table. Um, but I do wanna draw your attention to um, another type of codon called a start codon. And this is the red one listed here. There's only one codon, AUG, that codes for the amino acid um, methionine. And this is called a start codon because the ribosome will look for this codon um, to start tr translating um, a protein. And so methionine will be the first amino acid incorporated into every amino acid chain. Now the other um, type of codon I wanna draw your attention to are the stop codons, which are over here. Um, and stop codons do not code for um, an amino acid, but they do tell the ribosome that the amino acid chain is complete 
that that protein has now been fully built and it's now time to release that protein. And so just to kind of give you an example, if we go back to our, our um, RNA molecule up here, so the ribosome will actually scan for this AUG codon, our start codon, to incorporate the methionine as the very first amino acid. And then it will, it will read down the RNA molecule for each subsequent codon, incorporating the associated amino acid until all of the amino acids are incorporated into the protein. And then it, when it sees the stop codon, it knows that this protein has been fully built and it can now release that protein. So the next thing I wanna talk about are mutations and how changes in the DNA can impact a protein. So the first type of mutation I'm gonna to talk to you about are called point mutations. And point mutations are single nucleotide changes in the DNA. There are three types of, um, there are three types of point mutations that I'm gonna to talk to you about. Nonsense mutations, missense mutations, and silent mutations. So if we look over here on our, just our example case over here, we have our TTC DNA sequence. We have our paired AAG RNA codon. And in this case, AAG will code for lysine in the protein, which can be abbreviated either by LYS, the three letter abbreviation, or by the single letter L. Now, a nonsense mutation is a single nucleotide change in the DNA that converts our um, codon here that should be coding for lysine and it turns it into a stop codon. And stop codons are represented either by an X or by an asterisk. And what happens when the ribosome encounters a stop codon, it releases the protein and it thinks that that protein is now fully built. So um, in the case of when a ribosome incorporates a premature stop codon or when you have a mutation in the DNA like this, um, what happens is the protein gets terminated early and all of the amino acids that are downstream of that codon are never incorporated into the protein. And so you end up with uh, a truncated protein or what's called a protein that's been terminated early. And just to give you some examples of some common nonsense mutations, um, down here at the bottom, I, I'm showing you R168X, R255X, and R270X. And these are all stop codons. I've also indicated them in a different way, which you may have seen on your genetics report in the parentheses, but these are the same. And the way that you read this, um, these nonsense mutations, it means that there's an arginine at amino acid position 168 in the protein, that's now a stop or there's an arginine at position 255 in the protein that has now become a stop due to the mutation, and the arginine at position uh, 270 is now a stop. Now normally, um, full-length MECP2 protein contains 498 amino acids. <clears throat> so in each of these cases, it means all of the amino acids beyond these codons, or beyond these amino acids, are, are not being incorporated further. All right, so then the next type of mutation I wanna to talk to you about is called a missense mutation. And this is when you have a single nucleotide change in the DNA that changes the codon so that the wrong amino acid gets incorporated in that position. So in our example case here, we're looking for a lysine to be incorporated into our, our protein. But by changing the middle um, nucleotide in this codon, either to a G or to a C, you can see that the ribosome will now read this codon and incorporate a different amino acid than lysine. So arginine in this case, or threonine in this particular case. Now the rest of the amino acids will still be incorporated after a missense mutation. So you will still get a full length MECP2 protein with a missense mutation. You'll just have the wrong amino acid incorporated um, at that location. And so just some common um, missense mutations in MECP2 are R133C, T158M and R306C, and I've also given you the alternative um, nomenclature for those as well. Um, and the way that you read this, it means that there's an, an arginine at amino acid position 133 in the protein that's now been changed to a cysteine, that there's a threonine at position 158 that's now methionine, and the arginine that should be at position 306 is now a cysteine in each of these cases. Um, okay, and then the last type of point mutation I want to talk about are called silent mutations. And a silent mutation is when you have a single nucleotide change in the DNA um, that also results in a change in the codon, but due to the redundancy in that codon table where multiple codons will still give you the same amino acid, this is a case where that happens, where you can still have lysine incorporated from an AAA codon as well as the AAG codon. Now, in some cases, there's no negative effect 
um, from a protein by incorporating, um, by, by using a different codon for the lysine. And so sometimes you won't have any negative effects. But in other cases, if the ribosome stalls because it's looking for the match to that particular codon, it can cause a protein to misfold. And if that happens, sometimes you can have um, a dysfunctional proteins and that can lead to disease. Okay, so the next type of mutation I'd like to, to um, talk to you about are called frame shift mutations. Now, frame shift mutations are a change in the reading frame that alters the codon composition. <clears throat> so if we look at our example over here on the right side of the, of the screen, um, there are three potential frames that you can read in RNA molecule. So if you look at our top panel here, if you start building the codon based on the first nucleotide in the sequence, you can see that you set up the first codon as UCA, and then each subsequent codon is automatically indicated, and you can see which amino acids are corresponding with those codons, and in this case, we also have a stop. But you could shift over one nucleotide base and start reading the codon at the second position on our RNA molecule, and that will give you a second um, and different unique codon sequence for this RNA that will correspond to an entirely different set of amino acids. Um, and if you look down here at our third frame, this is when you shift over one more base, and this will give you the third and final set of codons for this particular RNA molecule. And again, you can see that this will, um, this sets up another and third set of unique codons. Um, but what's interesting about this particular case is this starts with an AUG. And like I mentioned before, ribosomes are looking for that AUG start codon because they know that that's where the protein should be built. So the start codon's position ensures that this is the frame that's chosen to build um, the protein. So based on how this works, you can imagine that if you have a single base insertion or deletion or even multiple insertions or deletions, you can significantly impact which bases are going to make up the codons and then which amino acids are then incorporated into the protein. Um, and so once you have the mutation or in this RNA sequence, everything downstream can be negatively affected. All right, and then um, the last type of mutation I wanna talk about are deletions, insertions, and inversion mutations. And these can occur on small scales, like we just talked about um, with the frame shifts, but they can also be um, very large scale mutations as well. And so a deletion is a removal of a section of nucleotides. And this can be anywhere from um, a handful of nucleotides to a portion of a gene or an entire gene or even um, entire regions of a chromosome. And so in this case, you're actually losing genetic information because, you're, um, because of the loss of these bases. You can also have another type of mutation called an insertion, and this is caused by adding extra nucleotides into the DNA sequence. And this could be a stretch of new bases that get incorporated, but more often it's also um, a duplication of a DNA section, and it will result in a repeat of um, some, some DNA sequence that already exists. Now, MECP2 duplication syndrome is an extreme example of this um, that results from a second copy or a duplication of the chromosome region that contains MECP2 and the surrounding genes. And then the last type of mutation I want to talk about are called inversions. And this is when you have a stretch of DNA that gets cut out, reversed, and then put back in in the opposite orientation. And so if you look up here at our reference molecule at the top, you can see before we get to each of these mutations, the codons are the amino acid sequence, I'm sorry, the nucleotide sequences are the same. But as soon as you get to the mutation, you can see there's significant disruptions downstream of those mutations. And those can have profound effects on the gene, on any RNA molecules that are built, and of course, any proteins that could um, come from that. All right, so uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is how um, protein or how uh, mutations can be designated. So there are two different ways that you can designate <clears throat> a mutation, either by the, the DNA sequence, by the nucleotide that's affected, or by the protein um, sequence and where you can specifically list it based on the amino, the amino acid that's been affected. So on the table here, I've just picked you know, four example mutations. We have a nonsense mutation at the top or a premature stop, a missense, and then two different frame shift mutations. And I'll walk you um, through each of these. 
So if we start with our first example at the top, the R294X mutation, um, the protein designation will always have a lowercase p period, and that stands for the protein reference sequence. And so what this is telling you is that the arginine at position 294 in that protein is now a stop codon. And it can also be designated um, this way with ARG, A-R-G as the three-letter abbreviation, and the stop indicated as an asterisk. Now, if you care about the DNA sequence, like um, some DNA editing um, scientists might, they can indicate this exact same mutation by referring to the nucleotide sequence. And so DNA mutations are listed with a lowercase c period, which is referring to uh, the coding DNA reference sequence. And so in this case, what this is telling you is that the C at position, at nucleotide position 880 is now a T. And it can also be designated this way, where um, you have 880 C to T transition. Okay, and this uh, same methodology uh, um, holds true for the missense mutations. So in this case, we're looking at our, our T158M mutation, um, showing you that there's the threonine at amino acid position 158 is now methionine. And you can express this um, in the same way in the nucleotide designation where the DNA base C at position 473 is now a T, um, or it can be expressed this way as well. Now for frame shift mutations, these are um, shown in a little different way. Um, where in this particular case, we have an insertion of um, 14 nucleotides. So nucleotide 44 to 57 has been duplicated. And in this case, this means that the nucleotide at position 806, which was a G, has been deleted. Now, in both of these cases, we're inserting and deleting bases. So if you remember, you're, that's going to have a significant effect on the codons and the amino acid um, components of the protein. So if you look at the protein designations in both of these cases, you'll see that amino acid change um, in both of these, but you'll also see this red FS that I've put in here, um, and that indicates that this is a frame shift mutation. And in some cases, that's all that you'll see. Um, and in other cases, there might be additional information beyond the frame shift designation, and that will tell you how many additional amino acids have been incorporated until that um, mutant protein terminates. All right, and then the last thing I want to talk to you about are um, ME, the com most common MECP2 mutations in Rett syndrome. So first I want you to focus on this graph on the right-hand side of the slide. And this is just the number of the different mutations on the y-axis and then the type of mutations across the bottom. And if you look here, you'll see a lot of the mutations we talked about today. Um, frame shift, insertion, and deletions are the most common, which as you can see here is the, the highest bar. And you can see there's a few other examples of some different types of frame shifts um, that are in here. So if you add all of those up together, you're going to have a lot of different mutations that are frame shifts from being an in insertion or deletion. So um, the point I want to make about this is if you're in a group of, say, 100 people with Rett syndrome, a lot of them are going to have frame shift mutations. But the chances of this mutation occurring in exactly the same way in another person is very low. And that's because you can have any number of bases inserted or deleted at any number of locations within the gene. So it's very likely that if you have a frame shift mutation, that you have a unique mutation. Now, if you look at missense silent and nonsense mutations, which are all point mutations, it's much more likely if you have a point mutation that you're going to share that mutation with someone else. And so if you look on the left-hand side, this is, our, this is a frequency table that shows you the frequency of these point mutations with the T158M mutation at the top at almost 9% and each subsequent mutation um, in decreasing frequency going down this list. So the take-home message is if you have a point mutation, you're much more likely to share that mutation with someone else. And if you have a frame shift mutation, it's much more likely that you will have a unique um, mutation. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and he's going to tell you how these mutations um, impact MECP2 function. Um. I'm just sharing my screen. Has this worked? Not yet. You hit the share button, the share blue button. Um, share. Yes. No. Yes, we see it now, Matt. Let's get it to slideshow. 
Okay, so thanks, Monica, for inviting me to talk today. Um, and thanks, Jana, for giving some background information. As Monica mentioned, I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a molecular biologist. Um, I'll say at the beginning that a, a strong motivation for most researchers studying MECP2 is the belief that as we learn more about MECP2 and its role in neurological disease, we will find ourselves in a much stronger position when it comes to trying to devise effective therapies for Rett syndrome. Um, and so today I want to share something about what the research community around the world has been able to learn about MECP2. Okay, so Jana has um, already explained that proteins are chains of building blocks known as amino acids. And these chains then fold up uh, to give a protein a three-dimensional shape that allows it to carry out its functions. Uh, an example of a well-known protein would be hemoglobin, which carries oxygen in the blood around the body. But pretty much any function you can think of in your body will be carried out by different proteins working either individually or in combination. So a challenge for researchers working on Rett syndrome has been to try to figure out what MECP2 does. Um, so I'm going to start by describing the important parts of the MECP2 protein. Then I'll try to explain how these parts of MECP2 work together and also how Rett syndrome causing mutations prevent these parts of MECP2 from working properly. And finally, I'll talk about a little bit about how what we've learned about MECP2 relates to MECP2 duplication syndrome a disease which is related to wet rat syndrome, except it is caused by a, an excess of the MECP2 protein. So here on the screen now, we're looking at a linear one-dimensional view of the MECP2 protein chain. The best understood part of MECP2 is the DNA binding domain, which I've highlighted here in blue. The instructions for making all proteins, including MECP2, are encoded in the DNA in the cell. However, once the MECP2 protein has been produced, MECP2 itself is then able to bind tightly to the DNA in a cell. We call this DNA binding domain the MBD. Um, I'm labeling it now. Uh, this stands for methyl binding domain. The reason for this name is that MECP2 does not bind indiscriminately to any DNA. It actually binds to particular sites in the DNA which have undergone a chemical modification known as methylation, which I'm showing here. Uh, this modification occurs frequently in DNA in neurons, and also MECP2 is a very abundant protein. So a consequence of this is that if you were able to shrink yourself down, get inside of a cell and have a look around, it would be extremely difficult to find any stretch of DNA that did not have an MECP2 protein molecule bound nearby. Another vital part of the MECP2 protein is labeled here now in pink. We call this region the NID or the NID. NID stands for NCORE interacting domain and this part of MECP2 binds to another protein known as NCORE. NCORE is actually a group of several other proteins bound tightly together. It has been studied by many people and there are literally hundreds of research papers about this protein. A brief summary of the work would be that NCORE is a protein thought to be responsible for switching off the production of other gene products. So you might ask why this type of regulation where genes are switched off and on is necessary and the answer is to do with the complexity of biology and because different types of cells in the body need to produce different proteins at different times in order, in order to function properly. So a topical example of this would be that the antibodies our bodies use to fight infections are produced specifically by certain cells of the immune system when we encounter something in the environment like a virus. So, if we think about these two key regions of MECP2 working together, then we arrive at a view like in this diagram, where 
a key function of MECP2 is to bind to DNA at these methylated sites uh, and then, oops, sorry, and then bringing the NCORE protein and then as a consequence uh, of NCORE being delivered to the DNA in the cell, um, it's not that the production of many gene products is turned off, but rather the production from many gene products is slightly turned down. Um, which is uh, indicated by this inhibition here. Um, the evidence for this view comes from many different experiments, but I just want to highlight one study from Will Renthal and Lisa Boxer, who worked in Professor Mike Greenberg's lab at Harvard Medical School. So previously, a lot of Rett syndrome research focused on mice, but Will and Lisa's study obtained access to Rett syndrome post-mortem brain samples and then they used a recently developed technology to be able to measure the extent to which every single gene is switched off or on in individual cells in the brain. I'm showing one piece of, data, of their data here, uh, revealing that genes with the most MECP2 binding sites, so at the right of this plot, um, these genes, uh, these are the ones that are switched on the most when MECP2 is absent in Rett syndrome. Um, so that's why this line slopes up towards the right. So this study supports the view that a major role of MECP2 is to dampen down the production of other gene products. So how do mutations which cause Rett syndrome interfere with this function? So Jana has already spoken about different types of mutation. Most of the common Rett syndrome causing mutations in MECP2 broadly fall into two categories. So one category of mutation results in shortened versions of MECP2 being produced. And some of these are labeled here. And these are found in cases of Rett syndrome where the mutation has a name sounding something like R168X. So in this case, the amino acid that would normally be found at position 168 in the chain, denoted by R, has been replaced by a stop signal denoted by X. Um, two other frequently occurring mutations in this category are R255X and R270X. In all these cases, we have a shortened version of MECP2 as shown in this illustration. And the result is that the MECP2 protein is missing at least one critical region and it's therefore unable to function properly. I should also say that there is an alternative notation for this type of mutation. You might see something like ARG168 asterisk written down. And this is just a different way of saying the same thing, where the amino acid arginine is abbreviated to ARG rather than R, and the stop signal is denoted by an asterisk rather than an X. The second category of mutation does not shorten the MECP2 protein. Instead, one of the amino acids along the chain is replaced by a different incorrect amino acid. I've labeled some of the most frequently occurring Rett syndrome mutations in this category on this diagram in red, and they are R133C, T158M, and R306C. For these mutations, MECP2 protein of the correct length is produced. For T158M, as a particular example, the amino acid threonine, which should be found at position 158, is instead replaced with the amino acid methionine. Again, there is an alternative notation for this type of mutation, which I know some parents might have seen on their child's genetic report. In this case, amino acids will be abbreviated to three letters, not one letter, and so T158M would become THR158. MET. These mutations where one amino acid is substituted for an incorrect amino acid almost always affect important parts of the protein. This includes the three examples in the diagram which all affect either the MBD or the NID. And then because the wrong amino acid has been incorporated, the shape of an important surface on MECP2 will be altered and then as a consequence MECP2 will not be able to function properly. So specifically, a mutated MBD would prevent MECP2 from binding to DNA, and a mutated NID 
would prevent MECP2 from binding to the NCORP protein. Both types of mutation would then prevent MECP2 from performing its main function, shown again in this diagram, of serving as a bridge between DNA and the NCORP protein. So my final information slide is about MECP2 duplication syndrome. MECP2 duplication syndrome has a similarity with Rett syndrome in that it is a severe neurological disorder. However, whereas Rett syndrome occurs when a mutation inactivates MECP2, duplication syndrome happens when an individual has gained an extra copy of the MECP2 gene. The consequence of this is that too much MECP2 protein is produced and this extra MECP2 seems to be detrimental in the brain. Something we've learned in recent years is that these detrimental effects seem to be because the extra MECP2 protein results in too much NCOR protein being brought to the DNA. We know this because of some studies that have relied upon using mice. So two research groups, those of Adrian Bird and Huda Zogby, have created mice which carry extra copies of the MECP2 gene in addition to the normal copy. I'm illustrating this here by having a diagram with two MECP2 proteins uh, binding to DNA and bringing in the NCOR protein. So these mice with this extra MECP2 protein are very sick. However, there is a second type of mouse where instead of introducing extra copies of normal MECP2, extra copies of MECP2 where the NID has been inactivated um, are added. And for this, we use the Rett syndrome causing mutation R306C. So these mice appear to be completely healthy. So it seems that the problem in MECP2 duplication syndrome is that MECP2 binds to DNA and then brings in too much of the NCOR complex. This is the precise opposite of the situation in Rett syndrome. And the exciting thing about this is that if and I have to say it is a big if for now, if we can find a drug that can somehow block the interaction between MECP2 and NCOR, then in principle, this would be a good candidate for a therapy for MECP2 duplication syndrome. So I'll finish by summarizing what we think we know about MECP2. Um, that is that it is a protein that can bind to DNA at sites of methylation. It can bring in this other protein called NCOR, a consequence of this protein being brought in is that production from nearby genes is, um, is, is, is dampened down. And that we, we also think that the reason that the mutations causing Rett syndrome do indeed cause Rett syndrome is because they prevent MECP2 from performing this function. And that can either be because they um, cause an alteration in the MBD or the NID and alter the shape of these parts of the protein, which prevents these part of the protein from working, or we could have mutations which shorten MECP2, um, which result in MECP2 protein missing at least one of these key, these two key parts. Um, and also I'll just mention a couple of questions that um, I guess occupy people who are thinking about research on MECP2 at the moment. So, you know, one question would be, how on earth does MECP2 have this, MECP2 and NCOR cooperate together to have this effect where they uh, reduce production of other gene products? We, we know that we, they do that, but we have very little understanding of how. Um, and a second question would be, we know that there are thousands of genes which are regulated by this uh, combination of MECP2 and NCOR, but we don't know which ones are important for the pathology of the disease. So maybe all of these genes that are um, deregulated contribute a little bit, or maybe there are a few key genes which contribute a lot to the problems in Rett syndrome. And that would have implications for how we would think about treating this disorder, because if we could identify a few important misregulated genes, then we could start to think about targeting those as a way of uh, treating Rett syndrome. So I'll just finish by showing a picture of some of my colleagues. We are 
uh, locked out of the university at the moment, but we're still um, trying to meet on Zoom and make what progress we can do while we're still um, locked out of the lab. Um, and I'll also thank the main funding bodies for us, which are the Wellcome Trust and the uh, Rett Syndrome Research Trust. Um, you know, we're, we're really grateful to the people who, um, who fund this research because it, it, it just wouldn't be possible to do anything meaningful without organizations like Rett Syndrome Research Trust. So um, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Wonderful. Matt. Yep, if you stop sharing, I'll take it over. Okay. So first of all, I know that was a lot of information to take in, especially for those of you that are hearing it for the first time. Um, if the technology worked out well, this should have um, streamed live on Facebook and, and therefore it's archived and we've also um, recorded it. So um, we'll make available the, the recording so you can listen to it uh, again. Um, and at the end, again, I'll, I'll give you our email addresses so you can always contact us for, for more questions. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of kind of general comments um, to, to the presentations that have already happened. One of the most common questions that I receive from parents um, is, is the one that says, I know my daughter's mutation or my son's mutation. What does this now mean? Um, in terms of, you know, severity le levels, can you give me a prognosis? Um, and, and the answer to that is that um, if you look at large numbers of individuals with the same mutation, there are some general correlations that can be made. So, for example, we know that the um, R133C mutation um, is, the, is the mildest mutation. We know that from... Um, Research, clinical research that, that's happened on, on children. We also know that from um, mouse models, um, from the bird lab and others. Um, so we know that 270X is one of the more um, severe mutations. We know that truncations that happen later in the protein are less severe than truncations that happen earlier. So these are, are general correlations that can be made. However, on a case-by-case -case basis, it's really difficult to do that. So there are children with quote unquote mild mutations that have a more severe presentation and the other way around. And, and the reason for that we think is that there are other um, genetic scenarios that play into severity levels. So for example, we hypothesize that a child's X inactivation status, um, you know, do they have more X's that are active that have the wild, that have the normal mutation versus the, the mutated one on um, or the other way around, we think that that plays into um, the severity levels. And also there could be um, the child's own genetic makeup, you know, alterations in other genes that might make the MECP2 mutation more severe or less severe. Um, you know, we know that to be a fact uh, in other diseases. We, we think that may be playing a role in why COVID-19 affects some people so severely while there are other people that are completely asymptomatic. Um, we, we, know, we may find out it has something to do with the amount of virus that they have in them, but it could also be their own genetic makeup um, that might be protecting them for fu from full-blown COVID uh, or might be predisposing them um, to more severe symptoms. So this is something that happens we, you know, in every disease. I actually happen to think that not being able to provide um, a strong prognosis is actually a good thing. Um, I, I think to tell a parent, oh, this is your child's mutation, your child will never walk, they'll never talk, they'll have seizures, they'll have scoliosis, I, I think would be devastating and in some, to some degree would, would cause this self-fulfilling prophecy, why bother trying to teach your child to walk if they are not gonna be walking? And, and I think having a more open-ended 
situation, you know, makes us all as parents kind of, you know, reach for the stars. M my daughter's 23. We're still working on, on walking. She's on the treadmill. She's in the stander. You know, we're, we're, we're still striving for that, um, you know, in, in large part, because I don't think what we have now, the status quo that we have now is, is what we'll have down the road. You know, I think there will be treatments and a cure that, that um, will provide dramatic improvement. And so we want to keep our kids in the best possible shape. Um, so that's my comments on, on correlating mutation to severity. And then um, the, the other comment that often, you know, that can be quite confusing um, to parents is that um, Rett syndrome is still a clinical diagnosis. Um, it is based on history um, and presentation of symptoms. Having a positive MECP2 mutation um, confirms the diagnosis, but you do not need an MECP2 mutation to have a clinical diagnosis of Rett syndrome. So this opens up situations where you can have a Rett diagnosis without an MECP2 mutation or an MECP2 mutation without a Rett diagnosis. Um, I think in, to some degree, this is kind of an aftermath situation um, because when Rett syndrome was first written about and described, we didn't know about MECP2 yet, you know, pre Huda Zadby's discovery in, in 1999. And so you needed, you know, Rett needed to be a, a clinical diagnosis because there wasn't a blood test that you can do. Um, we're in a different situation now. And, and um, you know, I'm not so sure that having Rett be a clinical diagnosis versus a genetic one is all that helpful. But having said that, that's, you know, that's still the kind of the current situation. Um, and then, you know, we, we hear about these Rett-like syndromes. So um, children, for example, with CDKL5 mutations or FOXG1 mutations, um, these, these were kids that before their gene was discovered as causing um, a syndrome, they might have been diagnosed with Rett syndrome. They may have fallen into that. They have a Rett diagnosis, but without an MECP2 mutation. Um, but now we know that, you know, their symptoms are caused by mutations in different genes. They have their own research programs that are being pursued. Um, I don't think it's overly helpful to call them Rett-like. I, I think they are their own disorders. Um, okay, so let's open it up for some Q and A. Um, hold on a sec. Uh, I've lost my toolbar. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll. Matt and Jana, can you guys see the? Um, can you see the questions too? Okay. I see the questions. Oh, look, there's mm -hmm. only a few right now, so we'll just start at the top. So Ashley asks, would studying female silent carriers be beneficial? So let me. Let me first explain what that means. So in, this is not a common occurrence, but there are some rare situation where the moms of children with Rett syndrome um, can have uh, a mutation in MECP2 itself. And there's two genetic situations where, where that can happen. One is it's only in her eggs. Um, and so every time she has a pregnancy, she has a 50% chance of passing it on to her child. Um, the other situation is that it's in all of her cells, um, but she has inactivated the majority of the X chromosomes that have the mutation. And so the active X chromosomes are, are the ones that have the normal MECP2. And, and so moms can be um, asymptomatic. They don't have any overt symptoms and they don't know that they're carriers um, until they have a child with Rett syndrome and are tested. Um, I, I don't, you know, I think there was a lot to learn in the past. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that there's tremendous amounts to be learned now, except maybe, and, and Matt and Jana, please jump in if, if you have a different perspective. Um, I think it, it could be valuable to learn um, what kind of symptoms might be associated with having an MECP2 mutation, even in, in a small number of cells. Um, the issue, however, is that the cells we're interested in are brain cells. Um, and it's difficult, you're not gonna, you know, it's difficult to know what the X inactivation status is in the brain. We're not gonna do brain biopsies. Um, Jan and Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I agree with what you said there, Monica. I guess 
probably the, the biggest discovery that has been in the study of Rett syndrome is the realization that it's caused by mutations in the MECP2 gene. And that discovery relied on studying um, female silent carriers. Um, but I think, I, I don't see how that population would really be used in, um, in the future. Okay, somebody else asked, asked about CRISPR technology. Um, do, do we see any possibilities with CRISPR technologies? Um, yes, we do. Uh, you know, first of all, CRISPR is being used in every research lab that we work with, sometimes just to do experiments, to, to knock out um, uh, a, a mutation, knock in a mutation in, in cell lines or to make mouse models. It's very routine technology that's now being used, but it's also being used um, in, in some of our um, curative uh, strategies like DNA editing, RNA editing, um, e even in some of the MECP2 reactivation. So very important technology. All right, I'm going to screen through these because we're getting more and more mutations. Um, well, so somebody asked how the Avexis research is going. Uh, and although that's not part of the topic here, I know it's on everybody's mind. And, and so I'll answer that question. Um, we have been in touch with the company. Um, they have told us that um, they will be giving an update um, as promised last year, mid-year this year. Um, so um, I think we just have to hang tight um, until then. And um, they're, they're you know, they'll be giving us an update. Obviously, we, we hope that the trials will be, you know, we'll be able to start. Um, should moms be tested if they're, to see if they are a silent carrier? Um, I think if you're planning more pregnancies, it's probably, it's a good idea to do it. Um, what it will tell you is if you have a mutation, you know, because they're gonna test your blood. And so they'll, they'll tell you if you have a mutation in your cells and if you've, you know, are a situation where you've inactivated um, the, the mutated X, it's, it's not going to tell you whether you have mutations in your eggs. Um, to do that, they'd have to take out some eggs and test them. Um, I, I know very few people who've actually had that done. I do know a few, but most, most moms will, will do the blood test and they'll know that at least that situation is, is not their situation. All right, I, I hope that that's clear. Um, okay, hold on, let me read through some of these. Um, Helen is having some trouble understanding NCOR with the MECP2. Helen, email me and I'll, I'll give you, you know, we'll, we'll go, we can discuss it. Um, um, let's see. Oh, one, one thing I wanted, some of you are asking about severity levels and. Uh, you know, with, with your own child's mutation. If you email me, I will send you a paper. Um, I'll try to put it on Facebook, but sometimes on pages you can't attach PDFs, um, but email me. And I will send you a paper um, written by a number of rec clinicians um, who have, you know, correlated on average, right, on average, correlated um, severity levels with different mutations. Um, and I think that might be helpful. Um, Janet says, after the FS, the frame shift, what does the X and the numbers behind it mean? Jana, can you answer that? Sure. So sometimes after the frame shift designation, there'll be some additional um, information, and that will tell you how many amino acids are incorporated beyond that um, frame shift and where the protein stops. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to, do we share our research with other scientists? How relevant is the research done on say SMA or Huntington's disease? Um, so the, you know, the typical way that scientists share research with each other is through publications. Um, our, we try at RSRT to not have scientists work in, in isolation, um, but we try to form consortiums or loose collaborations as much as we can. So for example, um, Adrian Bird's lab works collaboratively with two other labs, Michael Greenberg and, and um, Gail Mandel. Um, we have conference calls, we meet in person twice a year. Um, the postdocs sometimes uh, spend time in each other's labs. 
we have loose collaborations in our, our RNA editing and our um, reactivation of MECP2 consortiums and, and even in the clinical research area. Um, so we, we think it is important to try to share as much as possible because, you know, getting smart people working together tends to quicken um, the pace. Um, and then in terms of research going on for other diseases, yes, I think there's always some synergies and, and lessons learned um, between the diseases. Um, as Terry says, I like the last slide where you compare RET with FOXG1. Um, how do you compare, explain where you hear atypical versus full-blown RET? That's a good question. I, I think the atypical diagnosis is very often um, not used correctly. Um, the, the RET physicians have come up with certain criteria that they use and adhere to, um, you know, that, that would define what, what typical and uh, atypical is. But oftentimes, I think when kids are getting diagnosed by, by neurologists, geneticists, developmental pediatricians that may not be as familiar with Rett syndrome, they tend to use the atypical diagnosis very loosely um, and very commonly. Um, and so, you know, unless it's being used by somebody that really knows a lot about Rett, I, I would take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, what time is it? Okay, we're, we're coming up to the hour. Um, I want to put my, our email addresses here. If we did not get to your question, um, please feel free to email us. Um, and we're happy to try to answer them as fast as we can. We had a lot of people, so we've gotten a lot of, a lot of calls. So let's, let's see if we can take um, one more. Um, can it pass through the father? Asks Janet. Um, so most of the mutations um, actually come from a mutated sperm. Um, and that's been um, found in you know, an, a number of, of research uh, papers. Um, and, and lots of different labs have found the same thing. Um, and you know, probably this is, you know, and I think in part it's, it's statistics, right? And it's a numbers game. Men are making millions and millions of sperm every day and it's, it's quite easy, unfortunately, to have mistakes being made. Um, and probably I suspect, you know, every man is making some sperm that have the MECP2 mutation. And then it's just a matter of, you know, is, is that the sperm that was used to fertilize the egg? So it, it's not, you know, and, and most of us have kids that don't have uh, Rett syndrome, right? We have typical kids. And so it, it's not something that's really inherited. It doesn't mean because you have one child with Rett, you're going to have more, but it's, it's just, you know, there, there's so many sperm and some of them are gonna have mutations. Um, Jan and Matt, do you wanna add anything to that answer? Um, I think that was everything, Monica. Okay. All right. So. I hope you guys found it helpful. It was our first webinar. Um, I, I um, you know, give us feedback, please email me, let me know, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, what, what you might want to do different. I also want to mention that there's two of my colleagues that are on the phone um, calling in as well, Tim Freeman, um, who's our chief development officer um, and father to Eleanor, 10 year old um, girl that has Rett syndrome, and also um, Jennifer Endress, who's our family liaison. Um, and she also has a daughter, um, uh, Jillian. So um, I should have put their email addresses on here. I know many of you are in contact with them as well. Um, so we will plan other webinars. We'll, we'll, you know, I think the goal is to, you know, do more of these um, on the research end and maybe we'll, we'll add some other areas as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Matt and Jana. Really appreciate your time today. Everybody stay strong through the situation we're in. And um, we're all in this together. This, and you know, one, one important thing, and I think I'll, I'll end with this, is I think if it's one thing this has shown us this COVID situation is how important science is. Um, the only way we're gonna end it is through science. And um, I feel the same way about COVID and I feel the same way about RET. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.